This is the Monday, April 9th, 2018 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes for a brand new episode every other Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. In this episode, our time machine travels back to 1931, where we'll visit some familiar faces and close out the Durant family trilogy. Moving on from the Gilded Age and the Great War, we'll catch up with William and Ella Durant, the adult children of Union Pacific Railroad tycoon Dr. Thomas C. Durant in the final years of their complicated lives. Our guest is Sheila Myers, who first introduced us to the family in her novel, Imaginary Brightness. As they had their comfortable lives in the U.S. and in London, shattered by an economic panic, what we'd call a depression today. Book two, Castles in the Air, saw William and Ella locking horns as their father continued to exert influence on their lives from beyond the grave. In this final installment, The Night is Done, William and Ella cast their eyes back on their lives and confront the stark truth about their legacy and long gone fortune. Sheila Myers is an associate professor at Cayuga Community College, which feeds her passion for the Durant family in upstate New York's Adirondack Mountains. You can follow her on Twitter at Sheila M. Myers, or visit her online at www.wwdurantstory.com. And you can listen to her previous interviews with us on both Imaginary Brightness and Castles in the Air at historyauthor.com or wherever you're listening. We have well over 130 author interviews available for your history listening pleasure, so go click through our archives and you'll never be without some great conversation. Okay. Now that the conductor has punched our ticket, let's head back to the 30s and join Sheila Myers as the night is done. I'm joined via Skype by novelist Sheila Myers, author of The Night is Done, a Durant family saga. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Sheila. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me back, Dean. It's great to talk to you again. Well, I have really enjoyed going on this ride with you. I'm so happy that you continue to send your books. You sent me (laughs) the second and the third before they were publicly available, which for any reader that loves a book and knows that there's a book two and a book three coming, that's Christmas every day when you get a book like that. You just feel such a a thrill. And I love the Gilded Age, but I also love this period, and I love being able to follow people, whether it's in a newspaper or whether it's in a great novel, and you see – what occurs in that little dash that's on the headstone that says what happened those years when they were born and when they passed away. So here we are in The Night is Done, and that's not just the title for book three, but it's really a perfect way to describe your long journey with the Durants, the journeys you've taken readers like myself on with you, having hit the print button on that final page How does the completed trilogy match your vision that you started with when you were staring at the blank page that first day and said, okay, I'm going to do this? Yeah, that's a very good question because when I think back on why I got into uh, writing this story was because I was staying at a cabin in the woods. It was built by William Durant and I thought I was going to be writing a love story about him and his mistress that stayed in the cabin. And when I, you know, as things go, you start digging and digging and you find out more and more. And then suddenly I realized I had a much bigger story on my hands. And I think my approach to this was unique in the sense that I 
you know, I started by blogging about my research and putting it out there and letting people know what I was doing. And by doing that, I built an audience uh, who started following me and commenting and sending me emails. And I knew that I had enough for a trilogy. And I decided to publish the first book without really knowing what the third book would be. Um, you know, because <laughs> I knew I was going to be gathering more information as I went, but I didn't want to wait to get the first book out because I, like I said, I'd been blogging about it for almost two years and people were waiting to see what I had. So that's what I did. And looking back on it, it's, um, an interesting way to, to do it. I don't know if it's the best way. I don't know if other people that write fiction, historical fiction do it that way. Um, but for me, it, it seemed to work because I was always discovering along the way. I think it's really encouraging for people that want to write to hear that you took that first step. I had that old saying, once begun is half done in my head recently because I'd had this stack of shelves that I ran through my router to curve the edges and I kept meaning to paint them and I was going to paint the closet. And finally I said, let me just begin to paint it. And I was prodding myself with that. I do that when I want to encourage myself to do projects or around the house or writing where I just give myself that little push. And I say, well, okay, almost while you're still, your mind is trying to procrastinate, just let your hands start doing the work. Mm -hmm. And and don't listen to people who say there's there's going to be a million things out there. I have spoke about this in depth with Lori Holtz Anderson, who wrote the Seeds of America trilogy. And because those are for younger readers, she talked about how she got into writing and how you just need to start doing it. And we talked about developing that voice. You'll read lots of top ten lists, things to do as a new writer. Often they'll tell you things like specifically – don't plan to write a trilogy. Just write one book. Don't yeah. don't even try to pitch it. Yeah. But if you put some of these t 10 lists of things to do side by side, many of them, you know, maybe three, four, five, six of them will contradict. Yes. So you have to develop that muscle and say, well, what is going to work for me and what will not? And here you listen to your unique situation because no situation is the same. Right. And you said, well, I already have this audience. I have people interested. Let me write that first one. And it is different from the other two. Right. When you when you wrote the first one, it was very different from Castles in the Air, which is the second, and Now the Night is Done. You had the dual timeline novel, which right. is a lot of fun to do. It is. It was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> it was fun to read, and, and people were disappointed, weren't they, that you weren't going to have that in the, in the second and third? No, and... I did not get that feedback. Um, if anything, I got feedback from reviews. I don't – not people that I talk to personally, but I saw a couple reviews of people that in Imaginary Brightness, they did not like the – dual time frame. I know that is a certain thing. Some people, some people don't like jumping out of a book. You know, you know how, when you're mm. reading a book and you're going along and then all of a sudden another story comes along, you know, you don't like that. Yeah. And then other people do. So I, I think that's a matter of taste, but it is a lot more work to do that. So I didn't try to do it for book two and three, and I didn't really feel the need to. I think book one was really a way for people to understand the reason I said it in the present and the past was so that people understood that these places that William Westramp built in the Adirondacks still exist. And they're actually being utilized as research facilities and educational facilities. And they're being kept up and they have their own identity. And so I wanted to let readers know that this is these places are, are still there for them to go visit if they ever wanted to or, or whatever, that they have their own unique identity and history. So, but I didn't need to do that in book two or three, because then it was just really about William and Ella at that point. Imaginary Brightness, by the way, is the first novel for people that yes. want to Google it, because I was saying book one. But you can go into that, and then you can pick up the other two. And that's an interesting way to have gone about it, to confront that problem. I didn't see that at the time. I know I was talking to you a lot about the owls and the symbolism of it, of going back and forth, and how skillfully you did that, because that's not easy to do. But you also confronted something there, and met that challenge again and said, well, I'm going to go my own way. Every book doesn't have to be a rewrite of the first book. Right. How many sequels do we see in films where we say, well, you just retold the first movie right. and it was very weak this time. You didn't advance the characters at all. Yeah. And since you're dealing with real people here, you wanted to get real stuff in when you started writing your second book, Castles in the Air. This book, The Night is Done, finds us all the way in the far future year for the Durants of 1931. And that's yeah. a world away from horse and buggy and railroad heyday. Yep. We've had a whole slew of presidents between then. People are taking flight in the air. It's a whole different world 
from when we first met Ella and William Durant. And we speak about your research and how vividly you bring this time period to life that you write about. Well, now you're writing about the 30s or the early 30s. So how did you go about researching that period? How did you keep yourself motivated as a researcher and as an author so you could achieve that same realism that you had for the Gilded Age scenes and deliver it to readers? Right. That's a good question. I really had to look at the characters themselves that were narrating. So in The Night is Done, I have four narrators right? The four narratives, the narrator, um, Harold Hoschild, who's a copper magnate. And then I have Holtney Bigelow. And they're the two that they're hosting William, Harold's hosting William and Poultney's hosting Ella at their homes. And they're speaking to them about their lives. And so really what I did was I just looked at those two people that were the hosts. So I looked at Harold's life and I looked at Poultney's life and I did research on both men. And Harold, there isn't much on him in terms of biographies, except for a book written by his son named, and Adam Hashchild is, I believe he's at Stanford or maybe retired now. And he wrote a book called Half the Way Home about his father and their time, a lot of their time in the Adirondacks. So I, I read that to get a feel for Harold's character. And I also went to the Adirondack Museum and looked through Harold's notes because Harold, besides being, you know, an industrialist from that time period, he is also known for writing one of the first really large volumes of historical research on the Adirondacks called Township 34. So, you know, I knew that he had met with William in 1931 and William was in his early eighties. And I saw that in his notes and I saw letters written between him and William. And I, I thought, let's start there. That's a good place to start because I just wanted to know, I wanted the reader to feel like, what was it like to be in the room when they were talking about William's life? And likewise, I did the same with Pultney Bigelow, who he doesn't really have biographies written about him, but he's got a lot of like no books, but he, he, he sent all of his papers to the New York public library and they, they take up like 10 cases, thousands and thousands of letters. And then I found his family's website. Pulteney was a journalist with Harper's Magazine, so he's got a lot of written um, essays and articles out there. So it was easy to kind of track down Pulteney and, and what he was all about. And so, you know, there it was a, a time period, too, where what's interesting is, you know, Harold Hushchild was Jewish. And in the Adirondacks at the time, it was very unusual for a Jewish man to or family to own a large camp compound like he did. And at the same time, you have Pultney Bigelow, who was known to be an anti-Semite. So <laughs> I had some kind of interesting history to work with there on that. Precious conflict. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it was a way to kind of to delve into their characters enough to know where they were coming from. But I knew the story also really was about William and Ella. So it was more about how they interacted with them than anything else and what they at that stage in their life, what happened to them. So Ella was pretty well off. And William at that point was he had a second marriage, but he he was not wealthy in any sort in any way. He was, um you know, he ran a boarding house at that point. So that was kind of an interesting twist to their lives as well. When we spoke about book two, Castles in the Air, I mentioned that your dialogue reads as if it's from The Sopranos, where creator David Chase points out that nobody's ever really saying what they mean. And if you've watched the show and you have an ear for dialogue, or if you haven't watched it and you want to just pop in any episode and listen to some of these people talk and how they talk around things and how they're always looking for ways to kind of get on top of the person that's speaking to them. It's just fantastic dialogue. And as an aside, it's one of the rare shows where there's no improvising. It was exactly as David Chase wrote it. He didn't want the, he didn't want the actors to improvise when they were on the set. It was okay to try to give him some input when he was writing, but they, they did that only very rarely. And that's partly why to create this constant tension, this constant undertone where we as the viewers will see that, hey, wait a minute, it's just a complete lie, maybe for no reason oftentimes, because we know the whole story. The Night is Done picks up late in William and Ella's lives. And I wondered how you went about aging their voices when they're speaking so you could transport the reader into this final chapter. And they didn't sound like they were still people that were in their 20s, really still very much children because their father's still alive. How did you age that point of view so that we would hear them as older people and understand the journey that they'd gone through? 
Yeah, I so I did find some of their letters in Pulteney Bigelow's collection at New York Public Library. I found some of Ella and William had written to Pulteney and he had saved their letters. And they were both, again, in their um, late 70s, early 80s. And I found a letter that Ella had written to him in 1932. She had quoted a poem by James Ball Naylor. And it goes something like this. King David and King Solomon led many, many lives or had merry, merry lives with many, many wives. But when, when age, old age crept over them with their many, many qualms, King Solomon wrote the Proverbs and King David wrote the Psalms. And she said to Pulteney, remember how it was when we were younger and how close we were. And it was, it was just a nice, touching letter about the past. And it wasn't really filled with regret, but just much more about just as we age now and, and thinking about that how lucky our lives were, was basically what the letter was saying. And and then I found William's letter to Pulteney. So both of the letters were written, I think, because Pulteney's wife had died and they were saying sorry. And it was also close to his birthday. And in that letter, William was, you know, stating how he was, you know, old, but he was healthy. He didn't have a lot of money, but he, again, he was happy. And, and I remember just thinking to myself, okay, so if I were to write this perspective from them at that age, what, you know, what would they want to make sure people knew about them and what was their legacy? And did they feel that their lives were, had some sort of purpose? And so to me, that would be, if I were, I kind of put myself in their shoes and how would I feel at that age and how would I be talking about my life to somebody else? Because I, they're relaying their stories to their hosts, Pulteney and Harold. And that's how I approached it. And I thought a lot about people that I know that are elderly, my parents and others. And I kind of went with it from there. I had to put myself in 30 years ahead of where I am right now in age, but it wasn't too difficult to do. And it was nice because you could get philosophical. I could, you know, I got very philosophical in the writing, I felt, as they were thinking back on the things they had done and their lives. So that's how I approached it. And it was very, it was an interesting way to do it. So, you know, now I guess when I think about it, even though I said in imaginary brightness, I did the future, the present, and then went to the past. I guess I did that in this book. It was just a different time period. So you are in two stories. I forgot about that. You're in 1931 and then you go back. Yeah, I forgot. (laughs) (laughs) It's him reflecting and looking back. And so you are kind of thrown out of the story a couple of times. I hope people don't mind. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it makes sense at the time because it's still him telling their story. They're still, their their voice is still still going to be always in the past, even if it's just the recent past tense. But that's a great thing to read in the book. It's really enjoyable because you're rooting for people when you see what they went through in their early lives, Ellen William, with that domineering father and his influence, and you want them to be able to find some peace. We have that same wide point of view that I mentioned having in The Sopranos, where you see them in their lives, that they're suffering, that they're trying to do the right things, that they're they're confused about each other, they're taking each other the wrong way. They've really been set against each other by their parents or by their father anyway. Yeah. In fact, at one point, Ella says, this is why he didn't leave the will, because he wanted us to be at each other's throats. He didn't want to, I, I believe that, that that's more or less what she says. Yes. And she says to her, her brother, quote, One would think being free of my father's domineering influence would have made him a better man. Instead, he took on patterns of my father's behavior as if the fabric of our family was held together by the thread of my father's existence. And once he was gone, William felt the need to sew up loose ends. Throughout your three books, I've been really drawn to that influence that the elder Durant exerts on his children from beyond the grave. Usually when you murder your darlings, as they say in novelist terms, they're gone from the scene. But Dr. Durant is still exerting this influence on his children decades now after he is dead. So how much of that observation is yours, this idea of aging the characters that you just spoke about, and how much is influenced by your research? How did you find the balance there? Yeah, so a little background on Dr. Durant for the viewers who haven't read any of these books. So he built the Transcontinental Railroad. He was the vice president of Union Pacific, and he he's one of the characters in Hell on Wheels, Dr. Durant. He's very much portrayed as an evil guy in that TV series. And, you know, I read biographies about him and his relationship with Collis Huntington, who was at the time the head of the Central Pacific Railroad. 
And they were both robber barons. They were tyrants. They were all about just making money and they didn't care if and the way they made money was going to be ripping off the American citizen and the taxpayers, the government. And so he amassed a lot of wealth, Dr. Anted, through corrupt practices. And then when he ended up buying up a lot of land in the Adirondacks to open it up for tourism and be, you know, he was going to build a railroad infrastructure and, you know, there was mining and lumber interests there for him. That's when he invited his son along, who William at that point was about 25 and he had been living in England. And he invited him back and said, come on and help me do this. And I don't think they ever really knew each other very well because, you know, he, while he was building the transcontinental, Dr. Ant sent his family abroad and they pretty much were brought up in England. So, so his influence over them was money, really. That was his biggest playing card was his money. And he valued money, I think, more so over than his family. You know, I found references to Dr. Ant also besides reading biographies. I went looking through some of the digitized newspapers from the time period of the 1860s, early 1970s, when Thomas Durant, Dr. Durant was living in Brooklyn and also when he was working on the Transcontinental. And the papers, you know, call him the uh, money king. And they they look up to him almost like he's like, um, the way, I hate to say this because I know he's always in the news, but like Trump, like he was idolized by some people as being able to, you know, close the deal, you might say. And in one particular article, they talk about him being out on his yacht club in New York and he's got people out there with him and he tells them goodbye. I need to go ashore and because I'm I have to pay a million dollars before three o'clock and enjoy your sail out. And they, you know, they were just saying how generous he was and always entertaining. So I think William was influenced by that, by money more than anything. And, you know, when they were growing up, I'm sure Ella really didn't question anything and just went along for the ride. But I think when she aged and got into her twenties and started asserting her independence and then Dr. Durant dies, I think William just, he just assumed that he was going to take over and, and do what his father did and control Ella the way his father did. And it just didn't play out for Ella that way. She didn't want any more control over her life or her finances. And unfortunately, she had signed over her power of attorney. She was pressured into it. But that was the way William exerted influence over her, just like Dr. Durant exerted influence over them by money. And that's a, a really crappy way to have a relationship, <laughs> you know, a family relationship yeah. is, is when money's controlling your relationship, you know, it's never going to end up well. So that's why Ella launched this lawsuit over William. And I was fortunate that the court testimony from that lawsuit, which is from the 1895 through 1898, I found it. I had it in front of me a couple of times. It's at the Adirondack Museum. It was at the Winter Tour Museum. And so I was able to get copies made of that and scan through it. And really that's where I found a lot of information because both of them were just dragging all the skeletons out of the closet. You know, any minor thing that had happened in their life together, they were just pulling it all out. And it was interesting because in the court testimony, they talk a lot about letters that Ella had written and William had written back and forth to each other. And I, they must've made carbon copies back then. I couldn't figure out how they still had these letters, I don't know where they ended up, probably in some New York courthouse in some basement file. Hmm. But, you know, the court testimony was pretty good primary material to work with. And William uses his father as a defense a lot. Well, my father, you know, he didn't leave a will. My father would have liked it this way. You know, my father didn't tell me a lot about what to do or what not to do. He just put me in charge. And, you know, that's the way he ran things. He used his father as defense throughout the whole lawsuit. So I just went with that. You know, I figured William is just mimicking his father's behavior as a tyrant. <laughs> you use the word control. And speaking of tyranny and using money as a terrible basis for any relationship, if you have nothing else to back it up, yeah. it leads me perfectly into this next quote from Ella that I jotted down. She says, you told me what to do and I did what I wanted anyway. And it struck me that... From one perspective, it's defiant and it's inspiring and it's easy to have your first reaction be, you go, girl. But it's also sad when you look at it a second time, you look at it in a reflection of her whole life because it's reacting. Yes. It's very reactionary. She's just reacting to a domineering father by saying, I'm going to do what you told me not to do, all the things you told yeah. me what not to do, or I'm, I'm going to totally be against your example. So that's still letting this domineering parent 
this big figure in your life influence you because you're always have them in the back of your mind telling you. And so you're going to do things that aren't necessarily good for you either because sometimes they may be right. It's the idea of a broken clock and right. they would have had right. real clocks back then. So yeah. they would have known exactly like that. Yeah. It, it just you, And so I thought the good story is always about growth. And these are parts with Ella where we don't see that yeah. growth in her voice that I mentioned in the earlier question. Yeah. Is there a way that you wish you had seen the Durants grow, that you'd been able to pick up a new story and see some of that reconciliation and say, our father has passed away. Let's be friends like we were when we were both brother and sister as kids together right. by the end of their lives in a way that might have changed the story you were able to tell in The Night is Done. Yeah, I do. I really was looking for that. I was really looking for evidence of that. And what I did, I found the opposite because what I found in the notes and Harold Hushchild's notes in the Adirondack Museum and also I found newspaper accounts. Well, first of all, William's second wife hated Ella and called her, you know, said that Mrs. At that point, Ella was married to um, Charles Rose and she called her Mrs. Rose has ruined our lives. And this is after William had even died, that his second wife had written a letter to a lawyer stating that after Ella sued William, she won. And I'm not, I don't think I'm giving away the ending here because if you look this up on Wikipedia, it's just, it's there. So she won the lawsuit. But at that point, of course, William was broke. So she never really got any money, right? Well, what would you do? So if you sued your brother and you won, but you didn't get any money, wouldn't you just sort of hang it up and move on with your life? Especially, I thought she was already, she was married to somebody who was obviously doing well. Her son did very well in life. She wasn't destitute by any means. And yet she sued William again in the 1920s. And she knew he didn't have any money. So I thought to myself, what was the point of that? What? To me, that's just all about revenge and spite and just spiteful. And so that really was kind of disappointing for me um, when I found that because I just could not have them reconcile in the book at all. And I knew there was no reconciliation between the two of them in the end. And so it was disappointing. I think she matured, but I don't know how much. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, 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 I even found, and I think I, I referenced this a little bit in the book, The Night is Done. William was known for building these great camps in the Adirondacks and running his father's railroad empire for a short period of time. And Ella wasn't really well as well known, but she was a writer. She was an author. She wrote books. And she wrote a lot of articles for the New York Times, actually, essays, book reviews. And I, I was able to track those down. And one of them, though, was written in 1900. And it was titled The White Woman's Burden. And I read it and I was like, oh, God, she basically uh, slams the servants in New York City were trying to unionize and she slams the whole effort and the people that are organizing that effort and stating she thought that it was impertinent on their part that they should even be doing that and that really it's the people that uh, hire the servants that should be organizing and unionizing. And she refers to the servants as blackies and biddies and ignorant Irish girls. And I don't know, it was just kind of sad for me to see that this was Ella, the Ella I was writing about. And what are you going to do? You know, you can't, <laughs> yeah. can't change history, right? Even though you're writing a novelization, this is another thing that people develop, writers develop as a voice. You decide just how far you're going to go right. away to dramatize it. And so here, when you read something like that, then obviously you're not going to have her have a, a wonderful best friend that's a, a young Irish girl right. just off the boat. Yeah. And it's it's especially sad because there's her father's influence again on her in a negative sense where you'd think that having been somebody who was very much in the bottom rung of the family, very much just expected to do what they were told right. and had this relationship that was just a financial one and holding her leash tight, yeah. you would hope that she would then be able to have some empathy for people that were treated exactly the same way right off the boat or had their maybe they or their relatives had been held in slavery. And so you, you wish that moment for her and you just don't get it. No, you don't. And you know what's interesting is I was reading the biography of Alma Vanderbilt and, you know, the daughter that married one of the, the Marlboros. And her and her mother end up um, getting into the suffrage movement. But if you think about, you know, the Vanderbilts and how they probably treated their servants and staff, it was, it, what's the word for I'm looking for? It. I don't want it's hypocrisy might be too strong of a word, but it does seem like there was this elitist element, women that were wealthy 
and that had money that were intellectual wanted to join these causes for suffrage for women, the women's vote. And I know Ella was involved in that too, because in a scrapbook that was found in an attic later on in my research, somebody um, contacted me about a scrapbook they found. Ella had cut out a lot of articles that she was involved in the suffrage movement. And I think it's kind of ironic, you know, that they they were all about the woman's right to vote and and knew that they were being treated poorly. But I don't think that they, like you said, they had the empathy for other people that were being treated poorly. They were almost like in a second category from them. And that just surprised me a little, but I guess, you know, that's the way it is. I, it, it's almost like finding out about somebody who's an abolitionist and and knowing that they had servants they treated poorly. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, hmm. it doesn't make sense. It doesn't jive quite well, but you have to think about the time period, I guess, and, and go with it. So, you know, I don't really know a lot about Ella besides what I could dig up in these articles. And then finding out later, there were some scrapbooks found in an attic about her, but I just assumed from what I could tell that she was probably bitter in the end that she never got her full inheritance. My guest, who has just described perfectly three-dimensional characters, how you write them in fiction out of real life, how you want people to jump off the page is flawed and very real. And as Rod Serling said, he learned from writing the book The Man, which was the or the screenplay, I guess, for it, which was about the first African-American to become president. He felt he just made him too much a cipher, too perfect. He said, never write about a character that doesn't go to the bathroom, which I <laughs> thought was a great way to put it. That's in Ann Serling's book about her father. I plan to interview her sometime after this chat. We talk about that in this book. We've followed you all the way from the first book, which was Imaginary Brightness, and the sequel to that, Castles in the Air, book two, now we are on The Night is Done, a Durant family saga, the final book of the trilogy. You can follow our guest on Twitter at Sheila M. Myers or online at www.wwdurant.com. Harvey H. Kaiser, author of Great Camps of the Adirondacks, writes, quote, The trilogy of the Durant family is capped by this fascinating final volume, The Night is Done. In a vein of nostalgia, the story ends in William West Durant's last years and closes out a saga of tragic proportions as the vast Durant wealth and privilege is reduced to impoverished circumstances. Sheila, you mentioned that feeling that William has later in his life that he's at peace, that he finds ways to come to grips with this great fall that he's had in a way that his sister doesn't. There's a line from The Night is Done where you have William Durant writing Pulteney Bigelow, who you were speaking about in 1932, quote, I am poor, but I am happy. What more can most of us expect? Tell us the story and the meaning of that line for you as an author. How did it feel to come across that, to have it on the page and say, well, you, you had a little bit of growth there for William and you wanted to share it with your readers so that they would get that fuller picture of his life? Yeah. So I found that again, in, uh, as I referenced before, that letter that he sent to Pulteney Bigelow. And when I read it, I remember just sitting in that library. That's such a great library, by the way. And the people there were so helpful to me. But I was at that one of those desks and it was dark and it had, you know, one of those green reading lamps. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading this letter and it just it made my hands shake. I was just so touched by that. And I thought to myself, in the end, Maybe, you know, he realized it wasn't really about money for him because he lost it all. I don't I don't know if he knew how to take care of money and invest it well or, you know, obviously because he lost it all. And then when I went through the notes that I found, Harold Hoschild had, after William's death, had been collecting about William. And he had sent letters to William's former previous servants and staff and asked them what they thought of him. And, you know, he was a, a hard driver, but they all felt that he was a very generous person with his staff, which is very different, of course, from what I was just talking about with Ella. And so that really rounded out William's character for me when I was writing his character as 1931 in his early 80s, talking about his life. For me, I didn't think he was bitter in the end. You know, I think that's all we all hope for, that when we die, that we're not bitter, that we are appreciative of the life we had and accepting what our fate is. And I think that even though he wasn't a saint, that that's William at the end. So that made it, it made it a good ending for me. Good way to end the story. 
we've spoken before about how great it is when an author will have some pile of archive material dropped on them, letters, a diary, something like that, court records. And it's just a real blessing to a writer. Many of my authors have had that. I'm thinking of Gene Barr, for instance, a Civil War captain and his lady, and he just gets all these letters that somebody just finds up in an attic. Social media makes it easier than ever to find somebody and share that kind of thing with them. It's how we first met, and it's a great tool for authors to use. While you were writing The Night is Done, you had one of those moments where something drops on you, the God in a box almost, yes. and gives you something to flesh out things. They emailed you and said they owned one of Ella's scrapbooks. And that's wonderful to get the primary source. But since this isn't a novel, things can often go wrong and you're a human being and you probably thought, well, or I don't know, I won't put words in your mouth, but I would also think that you'd cringe maybe a little bit and say there's a chance that I'll have massive rewrites. I have a whole <laughs> big pile now of new stuff that I have to go through. Yeah. It is daunting yeah. to find out you're going to get it. All the, so I imagine you're a little bit torn. So talk about what that scrapbook revealed. Right. That's um. So I had been blogging, like I said, about my research, and I had blogged about uh, Lily and Tiffany, who showed up in some of the letters between Ella and Pulteney. And I found out that she was Ella's daughter-in-law. And so I blogged about it because I just wanted to know who she was. There was nothing on the internet. She was an artist. There was a few of her sketches and paintings that were on auction. And that's about all I could find. And because of that blog and my blogging about Ella, I, a family contacted me from Pennsylvania. And they had been given in the 1980s a scrapbook. It was Ella's scrapbook. And so in it, it had... A lot of newspaper articles she'd cut out. It had poems that were written to her from, it looked like a lover from England somewhere and somewhere in Europe. And there was her certificate of marriage, her first marriage. There was a certificate of her nursing certificate. And so there was this, all this material. And then an auction house contacted me in the Catskills and said that somebody had walked in with three scrapbooks that had once belonged to Lily and Tiffany, which is Ella's daughter-in-law, and they were in the same volume of scrapbooks. So I think Ella must have lived with her daughter-in-law for a while and compiled these scrapbooks got compiled by her and her daughter-in-law. They were separated, obviously, these scrapbooks. So I went, I looked through the scrapbooks. The family sent me digitized version of the scrapbook because I was in the middle of editing my last novel. And I thought, oh my God, you're right. I thought, what am I gonna find out about Ella that I didn't know? And I was lucky. I kind of pieced together her life and I did a pretty good job without having this scrapbook material. The only thing I got wrong was I had assumed she didn't finish her nursing degree, but she actually did get a midwife certificate because I just didn't see Ella I did research on what it was like to go through nursing school in England at the time period of 18, you know, it would have been like 1890, 1891. And I thought she could never have made it through this, but she did, I guess. So that was the only thing I got wrong. And everything else, uh, I think I pretty much got it right in terms of what motivated her and that she did have lovers and that Pulteney and her were very close. So I was surprised and a little worried, but it ended up okay. But like, that's why I ended the book the way I did with Harold making that comment that, you know, somebody else will come along and, and find something I couldn't find and it'll change a rewrite history. And I do believe that's true. I mean, I know I, through my research on the Durants, found some holes and fallacies in previous biographies about William West Durant. So that's just the way it goes, you know, especially as we start digitizing more and more historical documents. You have that in your acknowledgments for The Night is Done. You write, quote, I'm sure in the future someone will come along and find gaps in my research. And that made me wonder if you could fill any gap about this fascinating family after three books, if you could have somebody tweet you today at Sheila M. Myers, say, and send you, say, hey, I have this great volume that nobody knows about that I found in my grandmother's attic. What would you choose? What would you want to fill in? What blank spot where on the map of their lives it says, here there be monsters, would you like to be able to fill in? Yeah. So I was able to, William's divorce was very messy and there was a lot of gossip and rumor mongering going on around the Adirondacks, which I suppose is what happens in small towns. And the rumors kind of forced them into a divorce, I think, because there was rumors of adultery between William and his wife. And so what I was able to find was just newspaper accounts of the trial and it was thrown out of court. They just, you know, the adultery charges were never proven. And so 
that trial, that transcript from that trial, though, I couldn't find. And this is an interesting story because I did contact the New York State, I guess it's the law library. And the one, uh, one of the people that contacted me, he was able to lead me to the final divorce case. And that was unsealed. I, I unsealed it. It was had been sealed for 100 years since 1898. Wow. And that comes out in the book. You'll see what ended up the real reason they got divorced and what happened. But I couldn't find the court testimony from the first trial. I found out from the courthouse, you know, archivist there that all of these cases had been taken and sent to a researcher at Queens University named Leo Hershkowitz. And when they ran out of space at Queens, they went to Hofstra. And then when they ran out of space at Hofstra, they were donated to NYU. And NYU's had Leo Hershkowitz files for almost a decade now, and they're still cataloging them. There's that many. Wow. He collected everything. That guy's fascinating. Collected a lot of court cases and uh, material, ephemera material about New York City and New York. So they're still being cataloged. And that court case sits there in some file, and I wasn't able to access it. So that would be one thing that I always kind of regretted. I kept asking the librarians and asking, but I wasn't going to wait for the third book to come out. I just used the newspaper accounts of the trial to fill in the blanks. So will you satisfy your curiosity someday if you're able to go back or are you just going to keep moving forward? Well, if my, if they contacted me, I probably would go down and check it out. Yeah, I probably would. I just, I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little you know? bit of curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Another one of those muscles that you have to develop, right. I suppose, as a writer is to decide when, when it's time to stop and, and say I, the night is done. Right. So there right. you go. It's a perfect title. Yeah. So that's a perfect note for us to wrap up with the final question on. This is the final book of the trilogy of the Durant family saga. What can those of us who enjoyed riding with you in this plush Durant Pullman car over these years expect from you next? Yeah, so I've finished a draft manuscript, and I've been sitting on it. I haven't really done too much with it. I'm pitching it right now. It's about the smuggling trade in New York along the New York and Canadian border, and it's set in the early 1990s, and it's about the cigarette smuggling trade. And I'm also right now working on a novel, and I'm at the very beginning stages of the research and writing of a novel set um, in the Smoky Mountains during the Great Depression, and that will involve the Conservation Corps and just the development of Smoky Mountains as a national park. So I'm working on, you know, two projects, you might say, and I think I'm going to wait and get these two traditionally published because the self-publishing route, while it's very interesting, is a lot of, well, it's always a lot of work no matter what, I think. But the self-promotion is a lot of work. And also I would just like to get, I think I, it's just sort of the next step for me in my writing career is to get something traditionally published. I've been published in magazines and essays I've written and I'm doing a speaking tour now. I'm My summer is filled with speaking engagements and I'm getting paid for those. So I do feel like I've kind of hit the next level in my writing career and I'd like to take it to that next level. Well, Sheila Myers, it has been my personal pleasure and honor to get to know you and help a little bit with promotion and whatever's within my poor power to do. I really enjoyed The Night is Done, the final chapter in the Durant family saga. And for people who wonder, no, I wouldn't have an author back if I thought that the last two books were not as good as that very first book in a saga. So it's always a pleasant surprise to find, hey, this is exactly what I expected. The second course, the third course of a meal is just as great as the first one was. And you enjoy it and you feel satisfied at the end of that story. And like you really know the Durants. So thank you so much, not only for writing a great story, but for being an inspiration to authors who have a novel in themselves that they think they want to get out there and tell. Hopefully they'll go and start tapping away at the keys and take your example as encouragement for them and just keep pushing until they hit the shelves. Best of luck with all three books. And I'll look forward to your next project, whatever it is. Thanks, Dean. Great talking to you. Again, the book is The Night is Done, the conclusion of the Durant family saga, wrapping up the journey we began in imaginary brightness and continued through castles in the air. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copies at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate using the Amazon banner on our homepage the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take you to Amazon, and amazon.com 
gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional charge in your shopping cart. Once again, my sincere thanks to Sheila Myers for joining us and for transporting the whole time machine back to the early 1930s for a piece of the action. I also want to mention the covers of her books, because when I was talking about picking up the whole trilogy, I thought of how really nice the artwork is. They're unique books, and they have those pastel colors that draw you back into the period. But of course, we're not supposed to judge books by their covers. You can follow our guest on Twitter at Sheila M. Myers, or visit her online at www.durantstory.com. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. And we put up a History Author Show Instagram page a few months ago, so if you want to follow us there, check it out. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us in 14 days for our next all-new adventure right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the radio.